a lot of sacred cows. I guess it's that way. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how that, that saying started. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's it's one of those things that's just so misunderstood. And, and we've been taught for the past 40, 50 years one thing when it comes to heart health. And how's that working for us? Well. Like, are we doing better than we used to do 30 years ago? Worse. No. So you actually look at the stats. Since 2014, heart disease is actually up another 23%. That's since 2014. Now, much less considered 30, 40 years ago. Every year, there's more heart attacks. There's there's more deaths due to heart disease. There's more diagnosis. And it's happening younger and younger. So, so my goal is not to teach you um, everything there is to know about which which test to do, which one not to do, which drug to take. But I want you to ask different questions. The, my goal tonight is to get you to ask different questions when it comes to your health, specifically heart disease, but really for, for all health. And so the number one thing you always need to ask, no matter if you're talking with a cardiologist or an oncologist or a chiropractor or a plumber, right? You always ask, what's the cause? Or what are the causes? Right? So if, if that's all you do, all you get from tonight, you, you've made a huge change. So traditionally, you go to your doctor at about, what, 40, 40 years old or so, you start to be in the wrist zone, and they say your blood pressure is a little high, and then what happens? Give you medicine. And then how long are you supposed to be on that? Forever. Forever. And what happens if you take it for 30 years, religiously, and then you decide, you know what, I'm going to just go off this. What happens to you then? What happens to your blood pressure? <laughs> it goes right back up, right? Because it didn't fix the cause. The cause is not a lack of... Lipitor or, or whatever it is, right? So you go to your doctor and, and they say your cholesterol is a little bit in that abnormally high range. I recommend you take this step. And so you take that, guess what happens? It goes down a little bit. But do you think that decreases your, your risk of heart attack? No. It doesn't. So what? And so then how long are you supposed to take that step? Forever. Forever. <laughs> and so if you stop after a little while, you say, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna do something different, and you stop. Guess what happens to your cholesterol? The same thing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's not getting to the cause. It's not ever coming close to addressing the cause. And so the first part is you have to start thinking about your health differently. And so that's really what I want to I want to you know make sure that we get tonight. You could, yeah. I have a question. Already? That's just the intro. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I go to the doctor and they go and they take your who in your family has heart disease. Perfect. Yeah. Then they say to me. to um, you know, just let those ones die off or, or address this differently than we would everyone else. 
Right? That doesn't make any sense. It's the environment that causes that problem. And so when you talk about anything, heart disease, cancer, it, it's not a genetic component. Now there can be genes that are predisposed to that, but it's the environment that is what pulls the trigger. It's the, it's the crappy water, right? And, and the toxins in the water and the nutrition and the, and the lifestyle and the stress and the stuff that we're gonna go over, that's what activates those genes or deactivates those genes. And so, I, I don't know if that, that made sense or not. In my head, last this morning, I was thinking about Billy the Catfish and how silly it is to think of that. To think of the fact that if we treated that the same way that we treated our own health, that we'd be medicating, that we'd be throwing, we're doing hundreds of million dollars of research, all these cool plants and, and things and trying to make it a lab just to try to not have to fix the cause, which is pollution in the water. And it's the same thing in our, in our own bodies, right? It's taking responsibility away from you. Heart disease is a lifestyle created issue. And so that's, that's sometimes is a heavy thing because if it takes the blame off of the doctor or off of your genes or off of external forces, the, the blame lies here. Now, of course, you don't know what you don't know and if you just follow what your doctor says and, and, and you know that, that's one thing. But the responsibility is for a lifestyle created illness is your own. Like diabetes, you think about diabetes. Diabetes is 100% a lifestyle created issue, which leads then to more heart issues. And so, in order to combat that, you have to change the lifestyle that created, you have to change the environment. Does that make sense? Yes. So you have to ask different questions. It's, you're, not, you're not just at the mercy of what your genes say. Your genes are, are it's called epigenetics. You've heard of epigenetics? It's on top of genetics, epi means on top. So the genetic expression is dictated by the lifestyle. How many people have that BRCA1 gene, the breast cancer gene, and don't get breast cancer? Is there a lot? Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. There's, there's the majority. Mother and two of her sisters have it. So just because your dad had something, or your mom had something, or, or, or you know, it's in your lineage, it has, it has no bearing on whether or not you will. There's no, there's not a, a large genetic component. A very, very two, two or three percent genetic component. Does that answer that question? So when you think about heart disease, like it's. I don't think people, raise your hand if you have a loved one in your family affected with heart disease. Like, that's a huge amount. It's the number one cause of death due to disease. It's up to like 800 and, uh, I think it's like 860,000 people last year died of, of heart disease. So when you think about men, that's, that's one in two men will die of heart disease and one in three women. So this is a huge issue, right? Something that we need to address. So for me, someone like me, like I, I don't really think about that a lot, but it's happening younger and younger. And so something that has to be addressed right now. So, so here's the crazy part to me when I was researching this, 60% of 15 to 19 year olds already have plaque building up in coronary arteries. 60% of teenagers. So is that a genetic thing? <laughs> it's a 25% uh, of children age five and older already have plaque. 25, a quarter of kids that are five. So this is not an adult problem. This is happening younger and younger. And so if it happens, starts at five, then what's it look like at 35 or 40, right? So we got to do something different. We have to start asking different questions. So here's here's the, the, the gist of what this boils down to. Your body has an innate intelligence. If you look at nature, if you look at our, our, our um, creation that, that's out there, and I was telling a story where we're you know, meeting before we started seeing patients and I walked out to uh, my fence and my fence has a bunch of vines growing out in my backyard. And this one little strand of vine was about this long sticking straight up in the air. I was like, that's weird that, you know, they don't, they don't have strength enough to stand up on their own. So it was attached to something. So what I found is this thing was attached to a, a spider silk that was about this long connected all the way up to this huge spider web up like five or six feet from it. And if you just stop and zoom in on that, like appreciate the fact that a spider, for one, produced some of the strongest substance in the world right out of its own, own uh, body, it was able to connect it. When, if you actually stop and, and, and video the plant, this vine, what they do is they spin around in circles. It's super slow. You have to do it on a really uh, specialized camera, but they actually spin around looking for something to grab onto. There's actually an intelligence in there that allows those two to symbiotically work together to create an optimal optimal thing for the spider to be able to get the bugs that are on the vine and for the vine to be able to branch out to, to pollinate, to, to spread and to prosper. Like just, that's a very small example. And then you think about the human body and how amazing the body is. 
it's it's staggering to think of the intelligence that's in our world and 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 so who do you think is, is smarter that intelligence or man trying to play god with that intelligence hey. Hey. hey all day all day it's a and so you think about your body doesn't do the wrong thing for the wrong reason it's not making a mistake if it builds up uh, your, your blood pressure or makes a mistake if you have a fever. Those are all intentional for your body to be able to combat, to do exactly what it needs to do to be able to survive. And so when you come from that approach, you start asking really different questions. So instead, when, when your blood pressure is high, you say, okay, my body's <clears throat> smart, it's doing this for a reason. Why is it doing this? What's the cause behind it? That's not necessarily, high blood pressure isn't a bad thing necessarily. Long term, it is, but you have to figure out why it's there long term. High, high cholesterol isn't a bad thing. Uh, it is in the long term, but, but just because you don't want to look at it, like you think about a fever, a fever in a kid especially. Everybody gets upset about fevers in kids. It, think about how amazing your body's intelligence is that it's able to actually raise its own internal temperature to the point where it can actually cook off viruses, bacteria, foreign invaders. Like your body does that without any help. Without even you thinking about it, you probably really want it to go back down. But that intelligence that's in there is what's causing that to work so that you can thrive, survive, live a long, healthy life, be healthy, and fight off whatever it needs to fight off. So the body has an intelligence, right? We call it the innate, innate inborn intelligence. And so when you start from that, then you ask really a lot of different questions. The forces of that innate intelligence never seek to destroy uh, the structures in which they work. So, so there's not going to be your body's not going to do the wrong thing, right? For for the short term. And so, if there's something going on wrong or you know dangerous, we need to figure out what's the causes and address those. Does that make sense? Yes. That perspective. Can we go from that perspective from now on? Mm -hmm. It's hard. We weren't trained that way. You were trained that if you have a problem, you go to the doctor, and then guess what happens? You get a pill, and it either goes away or it doesn't, and if it doesn't, you go back and get another pill, and if it doesn't after that, then you go get it cut out. You know, I had a girl who just came in, she had chronic migraines. So uh, instead of saying, what's causing those migraines, they said, well, we know those nerves are, are the nerves that are, that are with, uh, tied to migraines, and we don't know what's causing the problem, but here, we're going to inject you with Botox. So she had 150 Botox injections in her occipital nerves and the nerves that, that are implicated with migraines. Are migraines caused by a lack of Botox in your body? <laughs> right? There's so many causes, like there's very specific and easy to, to correct causes for migraines. Not one of them is a lack of Botox or, or any other you know, nerve severing or anything like that. So you have to address the causes. And that's what this is. And then when we talk about heart disease, it's the same thing. Um, that's where we have to come from. Heart disease, obviously it, it's super, super common. But you know there's there's cultures where people live to 100 and over, they're, they're called blue zones, where they don't get heart disease, even as they age. They don't get cancer, they don't get eye degeneration, they don't get tooth, tooth decay. You know there's, there's civilizations on earth that, that live that way? So we wanna know what they're doing, right? Right? It's not what we're doing, I'll, I'll just give you, a, they're not taking statins, it's, it's not like secret, secret drug that they take that nobody else has access to. It's the way they honor their body and that intelligence. That's what we want to, want to learn and go through. One death every 38 seconds. It's a one trillion dollar industry. That's a lot of money for a lifestyle problem, right? So, so let's start, I want to go through cholesterol because cholesterol is one of the, the biggest, most misunderstood thing I need to look at. So, so cholesterol, somebody tell me what you know about cholesterol. What the general, you want me to move over so you can see me? Yeah. <laughs> what's, what's the general consensus when it comes to cholesterol? It's good and bad. Good and bad cholesterol, okay. Yeah. So we just went through the principle that there's nothing bad in your body. Your body's not doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. So one, we need to get rid of that. There's not a good and a bad. They both are vitally important for different reasons. And I'll go over what those reasons are in a moment. What else? Good and bad cholesterol. They want it under 140. Under 140, <laughs> which is... Okay, so that's, yeah. Your body makes cholesterol. Your body makes cholesterol, yeah. How about dietary cholesterol? Changing what you Yeah, can't decide. Can't decide on that one. And I think it's hereditary, too. Hereditary, okay. And if you have high fats, what they call bad, then if you're 
if your good is high enough, they don't care about the bad. Right. That's true. Isn't that weird? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. what I was told. Right. Well, your, your good is so good, we don't right. care about the bad. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so here's what I'll say to start. The mortality rate at if your if your cholesterol is 250 versus 150. Guess which which side dies of more, or has the highest rate of mortality? The one under 150. I the think. 150 one. And why is that? Any idea? So, stats to get it down. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the reasons. So, so cholesterol is the building blocks for for almost every um, thing in your body. So your body desperately needs cholesterol. Sixty percent of your brain weight is cholesterol. So when you're taking statins, guess what you're doing to your brain? You're shrinking your brain. Every single hormone in your body is directly made from cholesterol. Those are the building blocks for every hormone. Estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, insulin, cortisol, literally every single one. So guess what's happening to your body if you're taking statins? To the hormones. They're crashing, right? They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, have anybody ever been on statins before? I mean, you don't have to show your hand, but the fatigue that happens with them, right? Sleepless, joint, joint pain is huge with it, right? So, so I'm gonna go through these so, so you can understand one, we got to remember that cholesterol, no matter what it is in your body, it's not the enemy. So you have to, you have to say, my body's intelligent, that cholesterol may be high for a reason. So you, um, you brought up uh, uh, hereditary, right? The, some, some of the hereditary nature. So I actually had a mentor who had, he, he went and got his like yearly blood check and found out his cholesterol was 420. Right? It's pretty high, right? Yeah. So there's actually a, another a chiropractor down in Naples. So he said he, he approached it from our approach. He, the body's intelligent is doing this for a reason. So what he did was instead of going directly onto the, that cholesterol, the, the statin, um, he said, I'm gonna find the cause. And so what he found out after doing a bunch of testing is he actually had Lyme disease that he had contracted a year before. If you know anything about Lyme, it's um, once it gets into your brain, it's almost impossible to kill. It's, it's very, very good at hiding and if it's in your brain, it's neurodegenerative, it'll, it'll wear you down quickly. It's a big issue. So what was happening is his body was actually increasing the, testo or the, the testosterone, the cholesterol to block the blood brain barrier so that that Lyme could not attack and get into his nervous system tissue. That's pretty smart, right? So, so if he had done what the doctor had told him, take this pill to lower it, just blindly not knowing why it was up, he would have, that would have been able to go right into his nervous tissue. He would have been, uh, you know, the, one of those statistics of somebody who just starts going downhill really, really quickly with Lyme in your brain. Yeah. Huge, right? Like, just think about this. So, so you don't want to just blindly do things without understanding what the cause is. Any, anybody surprised already? No. <laughs> Not too much? That's good. And so, um, so you, what causes that high cholesterol? You said there's, there's a hereditary component. There could be, what's that? Yeah. Yeah, that's good, that's why you're here. So traditionally it's thought that you eat cholesterol and you have high cholesterol. All right. So when I was young, I was like, I don't know, probably less than 10, I got diagnosed with high cholesterol. And so my mom was a nurse, and what she understood was that, you know, eggs, the, the you know, saturated fats, those things are the things that increase cholesterol. What she didn't understand was, was the principle that we're talking about. She's starting to come around a little bit now. So I w we would go after church every Sunday to Ryan's Family Steakhouse. Anybody, Ryan's Family oh, Steakhouse? Yeah. It's like a Golden Corral type place. <laughs> so I would go and I would load up on the biggest salad I could get, put every veggie on it, put all the, I mean, just massive salad, which not very many 10 year olds would do. Mm -hmm. And I actually got yelled at for, for putting ranch dressing and eggs and cheese on my, my massive salad, <laughs> because that was what was believed to increase the, uh, right. cholesterol. So that is absolutely 100% false. There's never been a tie between dietary cholesterol and serum cholesterol, cholesterol in your blood. Never, never been shown. That's a little bit anti what, what's common knowledge right now, right? So what happened is in the 60s, the, the food pyramid came out, the modern food pyramid. And what did it say? <laughs> Eat a very low fat, yeah. high grain, high, high carbohydrate diet. And what have the numbers done on heart disease since then? <laughs> yeah, because they directly, that's the cause. That's a, a massive cause. 
is is that high cut and I'll actually talk about this a little bit more down the road what grains and sugars and those kind of things do um, I was about to say something really good <laughs> So, so Did they find out why your cholesterol was high at 10 years old? Or did it go down? Yeah, and well, I know why it was high now. And then, yeah, it's back to normal now. So I was raised, the way I was raised was the second you had a symptom, you take a medication. Mostly it was Advil. By that time I was taking normally four Ad, or Advil a day. Um, I was having, I had chronic headaches to the point where, you know those slats that are on stairs? I would stick my head between those slats to squeeze my head as hard as I could just to get some relief from these chronic headaches. I was on antibiotics constantly for uh, strep throat. I had strep throat constantly. I had mono like four times, which nobody gets mono four times. No, Debbie did. So my immune system wasn't working properly because of all of this. I had damaged gut. I was never breastfed, so I didn't have the, the bacteria in my gut that you're supposed to have constant antibiotics that came, the more uh, medications you, you take, the more it damages your gut. And so that cycle continued forever. And so what it does is creates inflammation. It creates a state of stress in your system. When there's a state of stress in your system, your body will respond. Cholesterol's job is to respond to stress. So if this, this road out here is really, really bumpy, and, and so, so call that an artery. The, the road out there is an artery. It's really bumpy with potholes and stuff. What your body will do is come and smooth it out. It's a healing molecule. It actually lay it down to smooth out, to, to get rid of those bumps. And so that chronic inflammation was um, damaging my body and my body was responding intelligently. That innate intelligence was responding to the damage. It's a different approach, right? Yeah. Usually different approach. So. So this is, this is you know, a big point right here. Does cholesterol cause heart disease? If, if we went to the back, there's a really gross dumpster back here that the Indian place throws a lot of food in. So if we went back there and there's a dead animal in there, so it's called a dead raccoon, and it had a bunch of maggots in it. Mm -hmm. Would it be logical to assume that the maggots killed the raccoon? No. 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 Right? That doesn't make any, nobody would ever say that. <laughs> no. Nobody would ever say that. But this is what's happened with cholesterol. Somebody dies of a heart attack, they cut them open and they have clogged arteries. They say, well, that's a smoking gun. Let's, let's blame that, right? It's no more, it's, it's no different than firemen showing up to a fire. Did the firemen cause the fire? No, they're there because there's a fire. It's the exact same. You see, the, like, it got confused and now it's just such a money-making industry, even though it's killing people, that it's just so backwards and they don't know what to do. It's so stuck in the regulation. And so this is, this is kind of one of the inspirations for this uh, talk was this book. It's called The Paleo Cardiologist. So what this guy does, he's a cardiologist, board certified. He was um, Arizona's cardiologist of the year. All these accolades was making multi-million dollars a year. And so he tells a story of what, what cardiology was like for him. And so when, and what happened when he actually woke up and realized what he was doing. Every single person who walked through the door was getting uh, a nuclear stress test. Every single person at twelve thousand uh, dollars a pop. That insurance paid for Medicare mostly, um, and every single person was doing that. So he started going down the, this, realizing that what was happening wasn't making people better, and so he basically left that system to open it his own. And he's been like super, super um, villainized for leaving modern medicine and going against it. But the reality is, he's getting people well without all the invasive, invasive issues. So it is oxidation of cholesterol, it is the oxidation of cholesterol that, that causes the heart disease, not necessarily just the cholesterol. So the question then is what causes, do you know what oxidation is? Rust. Yeah, rust. And so it's the degeneration, basically. Um, and so what causes the oxidation? Oxygen. It's inflammation. Inflammation is at the root of heart disease. So when there's inflammation in your body, your body's inflamed. It's there's there's um, your body's in a state of crisis. It's in a state of, of not healing properly. Cholesterol is what responds to that to cool the inflammation. It's like cholesterol is like throwing water on the fire. It's trying to cool everything down, but it can only do that for so long. So if you're inflamed and you're inflamed and you're inflamed and you're eating a terrible diet and you're stressed and you're creating the condition, creating the environment for the inflammation. Your body's going to keep on trying to do what it does best, which is get more cholesterol. And so, at the end of the day, it finally can't take any more, and you end up having a heart attack, and and blame the cholesterol. And that's not the problem. 
And so here's what happens when you undermine the innate intelligence of the body. Um, there's a higher death weight with low cholesterol than with high. It's a repair substance. Um, it repairs arteries, it repairs joints, it repairs all this stuff. And so, so here's a big part of it. it. Causes liver damage, causes neuropathy. This is all from statins. Joint pain, muscle wasting, depression. Um, it's a huge implicator for, for increased risk of cancer. And so what happened is they actually, when they first did the studies on statins, what they looked at, they looked at thousands and thousands of people's on both sides, taking statins and not taking statins. And they looked at the overall, over five years, the causes of, or, or the amount of deaths due to due heart attacks or heart events. And it was 3% in the group who did, or it was 3% of the group who took statins, and it was 4% in the group who took statins, or didn't take statins. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I got myself confused there. And so what they published is that there's a 25% reduction and heart disease victims because they're on a statin. 3% versus 4%. So that's not 25%, it is 25%, but it is not 25%. That is absolutely playing with numbers. What they didn't report was the higher risk of cancer. More people were dying of cancer on statins. More people were having liver issues, neuropathies, complications down the road. They didn't report any of that. They said 25% reduction in statins. And that was a landmark um, uh, study that launched statin use. And so, so now here we are, all these side effects. This is a really interesting part to me. This is gonna be a test on this, um, <laughs> this formula at the end. So this is, this is how um, cholesterol is made or synthesized, synth synthesized by your liver. So all you need to know is down at the bottom here, you, have, you put in acetyl-CoA and it pops out cholesterol and it pops out CoQ10. Anybody ever heard of CoQ10? Yeah. Do you know what it does? Lutein. It's it's the most powerful antioxidant your body has. It's cardioprotective. It's the most cardioprotective antioxidant you have, meaning it guards your heart better than anything else. So that's made from this process. Put statins block you right here. Okay. So guess what's never being made? You're never getting CoQ10. It should be a crime for somebody to put you on a statin and not recommend CoQ10. CoQ10, I think I, do I have? No, I didn't put it in the book. CoQ10 is one of those things that you, even if you're not on statins, you should have just from the cardioprotective benefit from the energy side. It, it's one of those molecules that um, it gets blocked if your liver is not working properly. But, so, so think about this, the most, the thing that protects your heart the most gets blocked by taking a statin. So when you're trying to protect your heart, you're doing more damage to it than if you were doing nothing to begin with. And that's what happens when you try to use man's intelligence instead of this divine intelligence that's inside us. You start running into issues, right? So we gotta, we gotta address it differently, start doing things differently. So do we all make enough of that? Do you make enough of it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, generally you do, yeah. You know, if you're, it'll operate, statins, then you're if you're taking statins, you're not making any of it. Right. And you have to be on a cookie right. tent, like without, with, there's not even a conversation. You have to be on a CoQ10 if you're on a statin, or if you've been on one, right? If you've been on one, especially most people who go on statins, they're not, not on for six months, right? It's like years and years and years, yeah. or decades. Um, it's, it's one of those that you just want, you, you need to have enough of in your body to protect. It protects your nervous system as well. It does a lot of different things, but if you've ever been on a statin or you're on a statin, you have to be on a CoQ10. This is ours, there's, there's plenty of other good ones. I always recommend our stuff because I know where it comes from. Um, so that there's that. So does that answer any questions on cholesterol so far? We're gonna get into some of the other, the reasons it goes up with the lifestyle stuff, yeah. What would happen if you were on a statin and you stopped taking it? Nothing, you'd get energy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your, your memory would come back, your joints would heal, you would start making um, your hormones back the way that they're supposed to be made. Save money. Save money. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, so here's a, so let me put a disclaimer here. I never recommend anybody just go cold turkey and quit their medication. That's something to do with the person who put you on that, unless they're like super resistant or just del delusionally keeping you on that because they want to whatever get get more money from that. But I don't recommend going home and just stopping everything or throwing it all out. You got to figure out again, figure out the causes. You know, this statins, if it was my mom or dad, I would say dump them out and never take them again. 
Uh, legally, I can't say that. <laughs> so, so it was my mom or dad, that's what I would say. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't figure out the cause. You still have to address the environment that created that, that high cholesterol in the first place. And what I recommend is do those two simultaneously. <coughs> you know, if it's the nutrition that you have to change, go through and change the nutrition to get it to the point where it's, where it's almost so low that you, <laughs> you have to get off it. This is what I recommend with blood pressure. You know, I don't want somebody to just go home and stop taking all their blood pressure medication because I say blood pressure is a good thing. Like blood pressure is a good thing short term. It's a necessary response. Um, but you don't want to just go cut it out. You have to address the causes, figure out why it's high, get that body healing, honoring that intelligence that's already in there. And that way you don't need it. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Different approach. So don't just go, go throw it out because the chiropractor said to. <laughs> yeah. Can you repeat exactly what cholesterol, what the cholesterol does for it to your body? Oh, if, so the, 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 the notes and I missed it. <laughs> so it's a huge chunk of your nerves. The biggest thing that um, cholesterol does is nervous system. It, it's the building blocks. So there's what's called around every nerve in your body, there's what's called myelin. It's, a, it's called the myelin sheath. I don't know if anybody's heard of this. It's, it's the protective covering that allows nerves to travel at 300 miles per hour. Without myelin, it slows down. It can't transmit, that the action potential can't go as fast. Myelin is all made from cholesterol. So brain, huge, huge amounts of, of uh, cholesterol in the brain because it's cardio, because it protects it, the, the nerves all around. Um, it's the building blocks for all, all, all cholesterol, all hormones, um, joint, Lining. Yeah, the uh, um, ar like arteries in your body. It's it's what smooths the arteries if there's damage due to inflammation. Got it. Those are the, those are the main ones. There's there's like a thousand more, but those are like the. The, <coughs> the myelin is that the one that cuts the shape? Okay. No. No, that's something else. Yeah. I can't remember what that's called. Right now. Okay. Nope, myelin is just the, the sheath that around. Um, and when I talk about the spine, I'm going to talk about myelin a little bit more. Okay. Basically, it's the building blocks for, for so much in your body that it, it can't be the problem. Everybody got this formula down? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. If you can pronounce like two of those, you get a... <laughs> you can see two of them. Well, yeah, yeah, they're kind of small. I didn't want you to really like focus on it. Okay. Just the fact that it starts up here, statins inhibit, cookie thin, baby cookie thin. So, blood pressure. <coughs> picture always makes me laugh. <laughs> what do you think is blood pressure doing? It's going up. Oh, right? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> good thing. In the right circumstance, high blood pressure is a vitally important process. Now, now you don't want it to stay up at, I don't know what his blood pressure would be right there. I bet it's really, really high. But you wouldn't want to get out of that danger and then have it stay there, certainly. But what that is, whatever, if it's a hippo, if it's a tiger, Dr. Amber doesn't like that, that example. If it's uh, a deadline at work, if it's financial problems, if it's relationship issues, whatever that stress is, it could be it could be your nutrition, it could be not sleeping properly, it could be uh, you name it. Whatever that stress is, is going to cause a physiological reaction in your body. And so instead of ignoring your physiology and saying, "Well, I know smarter than my brain, I'm going to take a pill to lower it." Figure out what that physiology is and where that interference is to correct that so that your body, you got to get away from the hippo, you know, and that may be a transition at work. That may be something in, in your, your brain or thought process or how you handle stress. It may be getting rid of a relationship or healing a relationship, whatever it is. I mean, there's a thousand different examples. You have to address that stress so that your body can get back into homeostasis, right? You've heard of the autonomic nervous system. So there's, there's the autonomic is the part that you don't control. It controls you. It's, you don't think about it. So it's divided into two parts. There's a sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system. You know the difference between these two? Sympathetic is your fight or flight. It's the hippo chasing you. Your, your blood pressure goes up. All your blood is going to go to your, your fast twitch muscles so they can get you away from the hippo. Your pupils dilate so you have a faster reaction time. In a, in a, in a uh, fight or flight state, your immune system is not the number one priority. Your hormones being balanced and everything being nice and, and, uh, and, and easy is not the number one priority. Your digestion is not uh, a priority. It's getting you away from that stress. Parasympathetic is the opposite. It's, it's, the, it's called rest and digest. 
it slows you down. Para, like parachute, slows you down. So if your body is constantly in that fight or flight state, you're, you're, it's creating inflammation, it's creating high blood pressure, it, you know, inflammation attracts more cholesterol. <laughs> the, and then on top of that, so now you're stressed, you're not sleeping properly. So you're gonna wake up, wake up whenever you wake up and, and chug a pot of coffee, right? <laughs> Which further increases the blood pressure, further increases that stress response. And then, and then you, you know, you just, you're craving something, anything quick. Most people, when they're waking up in the morning and putting sugar and cream in their coffee and then having like a, a high carb breakfast, like a bagel, or I know mine was pop tarts growing up. I had two uh, frosted brown sugar pop tarts every single morning. And if it wasn't that, then it was toaster strudels. You ever, the toaster strudels? Yeah. Like, those, like, those, that was my childhood. Now, it's a miracle I'm alive. It really is. <laughs> you think about that innate intelligence. Like I watched my nephew. My sister didn't. It didn't click for her until my nephew almost died from multiple issues when he was young. Um, but I, I watched for a whole week where he drank nothing but apple juice and ate nothing but fries and ranch dressing for a whole week in a two-year-old. That's a miracle. Like feed that to your dog and see how your dog does. Feed that. Pour, put that in a plant and see what the plant does. The fact that we're able to survive some of the stuff that we throw at ourselves is truly a miracle and a testament to the fact that there's there's a, a healing power and intelligence already in there, right? And so, so yeah, the, the, you gotta get out of that stress response, whatever that looks like. You can't beat your physiology. You'll, nature will always win, right? Your physiology will always win if you're trying to beat it. That's why there's no such thing as vaccine-induced long-term immunity because nature will win. It's going to change the virus, change. You know, and, and when we had the measles outbreak um, a couple of years ago, they said, you know, it was like 20 people that got the measles or something around Disney. Mm -hmm. And they said, we need everybody to be more vaccinated. If we got 100% vaccination, then we wouldn't have these problems. So Germany at the same time is 100% vaccinated. They're, I mean, like 90, as close as you can be uh, to 100% as possible. Mm -hmm. And they had an outbreak that was like, it was like in the thousands, multi-thousands of people getting the measles. And what happened is the virus mutated. <laughs> you can't, you have to, you have to honor the intelligence that's in there to get real immunity, to get real health, to, to, to have your body in a state of balance so that everything uh, heals and you don't end up with heart disease and cancer and all these other things. Make sense? Yeah, I mean, and so just, that's, that's just the state of our, our the state of our nation right now is not one of resting and healing, right? <laughs> and this is everything from turning on the news and, and being mindful of what goes into your head. Like if you're if you the first thing you do is look at the news, yeah. that's your reality. And if you live in that reality, then you're living in the reality that everyone's sick. They're, everyone's out to get you. They're gonna murder you, right? You're gonna get a shot to drive by. You're gonna terrorism. You're gonna get red tied, and, and like. There's, there's a, <laughs> your, your thoughts create your reality. And so if your thought is on the constantly stressed out side of life, taking medications to mask problems, um, just, just living in that world and then, you know, woe is me and, and whatever, it's, it's out of my control. My parents had it, so I'm gonna get it anyway. We're seeing as a society what that looks like, the results, the fruits of that as a society. And it's not good. We're in an absolute crisis. And then like we talked about with kids, like it's getting worse even in children because this is being pressed. And then you think about the information overload that most people have. The amount of, of information that's on this, or that's in this, or accessible by this, our brains have no way of processing. And so getting conscious about unplugging, getting away from that stress, however that needs to be done, and getting your body into that resting and healing mode. And I'll show you like some examples of what that looks like. And that's different for everyone. Some people, that may be exercising. You know, some people that's meditating, some people that's praying, some people that's yoga, some people that's going out to the mountains, some people that's fishing. Like it's different for everyone, but you have to find what works for you to get you out of that stress and away from the hippo. Because that more than anything creates heart disease. So, so what's the opposite of all that? It's, it's honoring what's already there. And so you think about Billy the catfish and, and the requirements that Billy the catfish has to be healthy needs like proper food, shrimp and whatever mollusks and whatever he eats. He needs clean water, right? Proper amount of oxygen in the water. There's not a whole lot that's required to be healthy. It's almost too simple for people. 
especially now we're in this society where it's <clears throat> what's the next you know advanced crazy technology and we're blessed as a nation to have the most amazing technology highest trained doctors and hospitals and access to all this but the reality is it's not making us more healthy because that's not where health comes from it's not from the outside it's from the inside and so when you're when we talk about five essentials it's it's the requirements that your body needs to be healthy it's the mindset first and foremost if you don't correct the mindset you don't get away from the stress away from the hippo understanding how to balance and, and maintain that stress you know that, that matters more than anything um, oxygen obviously we need to move and exercise and i'll go over what that looks like for you nutrition is huge and we're going to go over nutrition chiropractic the nervous system i'll show you uh, you're going to be blown away when i talk about chiropractic when it comes to this stuff and toxicity which is a, a big component now so you guys see this okay mm -hmm. so what controls the heart the nervous system. The brain, right? The nervous system runs the heart, the lungs, the liver, the spleen, the gallbladder, the intestines, the hormones, the immune system. The, like it's, the, that's, what, that's what runs the show, right? And so if your heart's not working properly, what's the first thing you should check? Your spinal column. What controls it, right? You check the power source. And so what happens is, I mean, so we know, I know you probably can't see over there as much, but your brain sends all of the messages. There's two main places where the nerves from your spine go to your heart. Right at the very, very top, right under your ears. Mm -hmm. It's called your vagus nerve. Have you ever heard of the vagus nerve? Mm -hmm. It's like the most powerful, awesome nerve with so many healing implications. Vagus nerve comes right out the very, right under your brain stem, right up here at the very at your atlas. Okay, it's T1. And then right down here at the lower, lower neck, those nerves right there in the shoulders, those go, those are the ones that go down your arm and they go directly into your heart. So, if there's problems on those nerves, how well is your heart gonna work? Not good. Not very well. So, this is what it should look like. Your spine should have a 40 to 45 degree curve. You should have the disc spaces all spaced out through there, lots of room, no interference to those nerves. Your body's not in a stress response to this state because everything's flowing and healing the way it should. If you look at the atlas right here, this top bone should be taking off like an airplane. It should be up at about a 30 degree angle. That's exactly what that, there's lots of spacing, Looks really beautiful up there. That body is healing. That's that's in a parasympathetic. That's in a healing state. So this one, what do you see as the difference there? That mine. That's not mine. The same thing. Is that mine? There's nobody in this room. I'd like the one on the left to be mine. Yeah. yeah. I, would too. I would too. I'm working. So so at least it's not this one. So this guy is actually his son was under care and said. Hey, my dad has um, atrial fib. What do you do about that? What, what can we do about that? He's just been told he's gonna be on medications for the rest of his life. Atrial fibrillation is an electrical problem in the heart. So when you have an electrical problem, guess what you do? Check the wires, right? You check the source. <laughs> and so what was happening, I said, so the first question I asked him, I'd never, I hadn't seen the dad yet. I only seen this guy, I said, when was this compression injury? Every single time I've ever seen atrial fibrillation, there's a compression injury. And so what that does is compress down here at the bottom of the neck. And so he goes, oh yeah, he had a, a really bad motorcycle wreck. <laughs> My husband. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but you, so you can see, when, so when we took the x-rays, yeah, so when we took the x-rays, what do you see there? So what's that doing to those nerves right here that go into the heart? Shutting them down the heart. And so this has been over, you know, decades long to, to the point where over time the heart stops working the way it should. It can't. It doesn't have the power source back in there. It's not plugged in all the way. And so first step is getting as much change as we can possibly get in here to, to allow the body to have the opportunity to heal itself. <clears throat> I forgot that it was. <laughs> yeah, this is his plan. I yeah. thought right away we start doing And so this isn't unique. By the way, we've had probably six. What well, Dr. Brock's dad is one, another one that's had amazing. Did you do you know much of that story? Um, I just know that before, obviously, he was on like a breathing thing at night, and Brock told him to get under chiropractic care, and he got his spine corrected, and he sent the machine back, and he actually went to his cardiologist and told him what he was doing, and the cardiologist was like, "Well, if that's what's working for you, then." 
And so step one then with this spine is we gotta get it moving. You gotta get, now, now you can see there's a lot of damage there. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's some damage that's, there's a limitation of matter, right? It's never gonna be back like this spine because it's been that way for 40, 50 years. But what he did was he transformed his lifestyle. <laughs> you can you can speak to this like you, exercising all the time, playing tennis and golf and, and activity, mountain biking. Uh, he he gave up alcohol all the way, changed, transformed his diet, not eating as much sugar and those kind of things. All everything that he was doing was taking his body out of that stress response so that it, it had the opportunity to heal. Now there's so much damage. He actually went in and had some. You know, luckily we have an amazing uh, resource in our medical system when there's limitations of matter, we're able to overcome that sometimes. So he went in and had a little bit of work done there as well. Uh, and, and over the last year, we were talking about this yesterday, he's been completely free of AFib. You know, and that's, that's not an uncommon thing when you get to the cause, right? When you, when you check the wires, make sure everything's working. I can't tell you how many people I've had either with AFib or um, just early signs of heart not working the way it should. Whether that's the you know blood pressure issues or just um, heart flutters or, or things, your body balances out and it heals when you give it the right environment to heal. And so that's where we always start with check the nerve, nervous system, check what controls it, um, make sure that your body has the opportunity to heal. Make sense? Okay. So heart disease, one of the, the major cause of heart disease is inflammation. <clears throat> Basically what happens is that the more inflammation you have, the more um, the, the blood pressure goes up in your body, there is a whole chain of reactions that leads to the arteries being damaged. And so when an artery is damaged, what the body does is, is send in cholesterol to heal it. Right? And so it constrict, the blood becomes prone to clot, white blood cells, scar, the, basically it ends up scarring, when the inflammation is high it, and blood pressure is high, it ends up scarring the arteries. And when they're scarred arteries, the, the cholesterol is going to come in and try to coat that. But if you don't do anything to change what caused it to begin with, it's going to keep on happening to those arteries. When it keeps on happening to the arteries, the body's going to do what it's supposed to do, which is heal. Keeps on happening, heal, keep on happening, heal. Eventually, it comes to an apex where there's just no more healing that can take place because you've damaged it so much over, over years. On average, a heart attack takes some, like 17 to 20 years to develop. You know, and so there's a lot of opportunity, one, for reversal. But two, um, you know, it, it takes a long time to get to that point. It takes a lot of a, a lot of lifestyle there to do that. So, what does the nutrition look like? This is <laughs> this is kind of a hotly contested thing right now. So, there's there's one group that says absolutely no fat, and and eat all plants, and there's the other group that says eat eat pretty much all plants, but have some naturally raised uh, meat, and and have you know sort oils and, and fats from good sources. By far, that's what our bodies are designed to do. Where, you know, you think about our, our ancestors, however long you want to go back, before the agricultural revolution, there was no such thing as um, a farm where you just sit and grab whatever's at the farm. You know, you were hunter-gatherers. And so as a hunter-gatherer, yes, you come across a lot of plants and you eat those. And that's the majority, you're foraging, you're gathering, you're, but at the same time, you're also hunting. <laughs> You know, you'll, you'll go kill a deer or kill a rabbit or whatever. Then you have that. Your bodies were designed to eat real foods. The, the nutrition for this isn't hard. It's not mind blowing. It's harder to follow just because we have access to pizza and, and ice creams and, and uh, you know, McDonald's and, and all these synthetic things that cause a lot of problems. But nutrition isn't hard. Just eat real food. Eat foods by God, not foods by man. It's not like blowing anyone's minds, right? Like if, if you can't pronounce the ingredients or if it has a bunch, like a couple, few, I try to cap it at two or three ingredients, five ingredients maybe. But when you look at the ingredients in a Lunchable, it's got 125 ingredients in a little Lunchable and we wonder why our kids are sicker than ever and why ADHD is crazy diagnosis right now. Half of those are sugar. And so what, that's, what is that gonna do to a little kid's developing brain? And you know, combine that with some the, some pop tarts at breakfast and apple juice and, or orange juice, and you, you see where I'm going. Like it, it builds up quickly, and so nutrition, it's not, it's it's eating mostly plants, and then healthy proteins. If you're going to eat protein, like if you're going to eat a cow, it needs to be a grass-fed cow. Like there's just no way around it. 
Cows are not designed to eat corn and soybeans. When they do, they produce a really um, bad balance of omega-6s to omega-3s, which is, creates more inflammation, which damages the arteries, which creates this snowball effect, right? So if you're going to eat fish, it should be wild, like wild salmon, not, not farm-raised. You look at the sludge that's in farm-raised, what they're eating, it's like sawdust and all kinds of uh, um, toxins and pesticides that are things that get into the water. It should be wild. And, and you actually look at the, the chemical makeup of a fish that's wild and swimming on its own versus the chemical makeup in the, in the fat content and things of a fish that's raised in a farm, it's drastically different. You gotta honor that intelligence of what you're eating and, and their intelligence as well as what you're eating. Does that make sense? Any questions on anything so far? So we, so this is one of those things that people have been told for since the 60s, this is one of the things that you need to be eating, right? For fiber. And so what we does, it has a whole bunch of different things, over 200 documented adverse effects. The main thing is that it does is it, it there's, there's one main hormone which dictates all of weight loss, almost all of inflammation, all, you know, a lot of negative problems that happen with this one hormone. You know what it is? It's a, it's a king of all hormones. Glucose. Opposite of cortisol. What about opposite? Insulin. Glucose. Insulin. 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 So insulin is the king when it comes to hormones. Cortisol is, is significant as a stress hormone, but insulin is what creates the stress to begin with or, or um, the sources. So anything that raises your insulin is going to damage your heart. It's not an if, it's a when. It will damage your heart. And so the higher your, or consistently higher your insulin levels are, mm -hmm. which, how, how do you raise your insulin levels? Sugar. Sugar. Carbohydrates, Sugar. Sugars, carbohydrates, things that turn quickly into sugar, yeah. Mm -hmm. So anything that does that excessively high insulin is going to create inflammation, damage arteries, have a huge adverse react, um, reaction on, on this. So, so wheat is one of those huge ones. Wheat is one of those, you know, any kind of breads, those, those, those things that turn quickly into sugar and raise your glucose levels and raise your insulin levels, damage a lot of issues, create a lot of issues. Oh, no surprise there. And if you are gonna eat wheat, there is a, there's a better approach. Anybody ever, Ezekiel bread? You heard of Ezekiel bread? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it's in the frozen food section mm -hmm. uh, and it's sprouted, it's ancient sprouted grains. So our modern grains, are sprayed with Roundup, for one, so they have gly glyphosate on them, which is severely toxic for your neurology, for your heart, for everything, damages your gut. It's been linked with autism and, and a thousand other things. Our modern wheat is, is awful for that, but it's also genetically modified so that it's more hardy, so it grows quicker, it's bug resistant, so if the bugs won't eat it, why should you? <laughs> right, they, the bugs won't eat it. They, they bred out those characteristics so that they're able to produce more of it and, and mass produce. So, so ancient grains, on the other hand, um, have a much higher protein content. They have a much lower gluten <coughs> content, which we've all heard about gluten these days, right? <laughs> Creates inflammation. Um, and it, it doesn't have a lot of the side effects. So I'm not saying go out and you, you know, eat bread every day or anything, but if you are craving something that with grains, go and, and do the better option and protect your heart while you're at it. Cortisol and insulin, yeah, sugar increases blood sugar. Um, yeah. So basically cortisol, cortisol and insulin, insulin being the main one, increases inflammation, which causes 90% of all diseases, but especially heart disease. And it, the big thing that it, the inflammation does is damage those arteries. And so the more the arteries are damaged, the more, the more they're gonna get blocked. So let me tell you a story. We'll, we'll take a pause here and tell you a story. So uh, I knew a man, um, still know a man actually, uh, he was my ex-father-in-law. I got divorced about six years ago, so I haven't spoken with him in a while, but while, while I was his son-in-law, we uh, were away in college and got a call that he had had a sudden heart attack. Okay. So, of course, never a fun phone call to have. And what they found is that he had 100% blockage of his left anterior descending artery, <clears throat> which is the widow man. Have you heard of, heard of that? Yeah, the main one, the main one that pumps blood to your entire, like if you have that blocked, you die. So what they had done is they'd gone in, this is about six months before, they'd gone in, they'd put a stent in. And so anyone knows what a stent is, it's basically going in to open up the artery, 
because they think if it's clogged, if you open it, it'll, it'll prevent heart attacks, which it actually does the opposite, which we found out later. So what they had actually found is he had 100% blockage of his left anterior descending artery, but the body's intelligence, I mean, this is, this is just incredible to me. It had happened slowly. He had been damaged in the body for a long time. He had 100% new um, artery growth to reroute blood around that blocked artery. That's an incredible intelligence. The body was aware that this was going on and so nothing was going to be done different with the lifestyle. So we're gonna start rerouting and making new arteries so that that area can still get blood. So what happened is they went in and put a stent in. And what a stent has in it is a slow release um, chemical which stops angiogenesis, stops new blood vessel growth. So exactly what saved his life to begin with is, was killing him. And so he ended up having another heart attack. Thankfully he survived. Still hasn't changed anything lifestyle. He's a ticking time bomb. Like what, why does it take that and even still sometimes not that for you to like change your lifestyle? Doesn't make any sense to me. But that's beside the point. That's the intelligence that's in that body. That even if it's blocked, it can still reroute and get, get arteries to go and actually still make still make enough blood and oxygen to that area to, to thrive. It's when you start going and messing around with it that it becomes an issue. That's why I said it right here, wherever I said it. The, uh, <coughs> where, where is the stem? It was changed. Oh, we didn't write it down? We changed them. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's why <laughs> stents cause That's more issues. <laughs> and so, so yeah. And why, they did, why don't these doctors know this, this information? So the studies are all there. So you actually, I recommend everybody go read this book. This is a pretty amazing, it's called the author? Uh, Jack Wolfson, Dr. Jack, Jack Wolfson. So they, the study, the research is all there, but that's not where the money is. One of the tests, they do a test, find out it's 98% in the widow maker, yep. and they put a stent in them, and they use a four stent. So now I call the, the stent family, but it's, now how, do you, how would I even go about telling my sister, well, you know what, I can't. I can't. I can listen to what you tell me and protect myself, yep. but I can't do anything. I can't tell her all of this because she won't believe me. And I. Yeah. So. Send what's her, a full send, send her a book. book. That's yeah, paleo. Paleo, 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 paleo cardiologist. Paleo. Yeah, send her a book. The reality is not everyone's gonna agree, and that's okay. And I, I mean, I know that not everyone agrees. Doctors make make us all sick for no reason. Well, for money. it's yeah, not their it's not their fault. Who's, who's responsible for your health? If I didn't come to you, I wouldn't know all this. I know. And so, you know, and so you don't want to like blame blame anyone other than just realize, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And so life is a process of learning and sometimes you have to go through lessons in order to learn off. Sometimes they're really hard lessons that you have to learn. And sometimes it's, you know, it, that's okay. You know, it's all part of the, the process and you needed to be where you were to get to where you are. And that's all right. Mm -hmm. Whether that's you know, that's a disease, whether that's you know a relationship, whatever it is, that's okay. You just go forward with love, forgive yourself for what you didn't know, forgive other people for what they don't know, what they're stuck in, because the reality is that's that's life and death to, to a lot of people. So you can't get rid of the stent. You can't say they just had a stent out. I don't think so. I don't really know that. I don't I doubt it. But you can cause what changed the problem in the first place. Remember, always get to the cause. Change the nutrition, get rid of the, the stress lifestyle, and your body will heal itself. There is plenty of studies saying that blacking of arteries is not permanent. It doesn't have to be permanent. Oh, it can be reversed. It absolutely can be reversed. Plenty of studies on that. And a lot of patients don't want to do the work. Yep. Um, I had worked for a cardiologist, and out of all the people that he said had bypass, that were smokers at the time of bypass, 50% of them went back to smoking. Crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a bypass is that you know you're talking about stents. Yeah. And the newer stents, which fortunately I have seven, but they were all before the medication ones. So right now, it sounds like that was a good idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but bypass. I mean, I had 100 percent, 98 percent. Sure. But they went in and did bypass. Now those that. I mean, when you get to that point, plus the one I had 100 percent blocked did the same thing you were talking about. There was. Yeah. It would, but the thing of it was, when I exerted quickly. I would run out of breath. I could run. I was running three miles. It's certainly, a day. I rode the bike twenty-two miles in ninety-five degree heat. Had a heart attack when I was done. Yeah, but I didn't know I was blocked. Right. So it's certainly not like a, a one size. Fit.
fits all. Like yeah. there's still individuals, there's still still you know a lot in play there, and and um, so sometimes it's absolutely warranted. That's that's what he says in here too. Like there are time and place, but again, it's a five percent versus a ninety five percent. You know that five percent absolutely. You need crisis intervention, surgeries, stents, maybe like you need those things in the five percent. But it's the ninety five percent that we're talking about. That's one, the preventative, but two, like what are the steps to take? So he, he always talks about like, he's very, very reluctant to do uh, a lot of testing. Like he'll do specific testing, but a lot of the unnecessary testing, like a nuclear stress test, and a lot of these these uh, coronary, you know, the, the, the bypass and things like that, he tried to exhaust all the other options first. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Um, is he also recommending the paleo diet? Yeah. EDTA. Yeah, I mean it's. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, I don't think he talks about it in there. I mean, it's it's that's more for a toxicity, which toxicity can can absolutely create um, inflammation. And so it's yeah, it's that's another one of those just routes to get rid of inflammation. I think. So, sudden death, cardiac death is reduced when consuming higher levels of omega three fatty acids. So this is why we. I recommend every single person in the whole world take some sort of, of omega fatty acid. You know, that, that fish oil, those omega-3s. Our bodies are so out of balance with, with um, our, all of our poor nutrition inflammation. It increases <sighs> omega-6 ratios, omega-6 to omega-3. The higher that ratio, the more inflammation is in the body. And so this, this good fatty wild fish like salmon or just taking it from an omega or stuff like sardines has a really good ratio. Anybody like sardines like out of a can? Ooh, yeah, like they're really I good. Like Put them on some like rice chips or something. Yeah. Um, the higher, is, you know, that's that's majorly major inflammation and reducing uh, inflammation. <clears throat> what a, a lot of people don't realize is how important vitamin D is for their heart. So, does anybody get like forty to forty-five minutes on at least half their body of sunlight every day? <laughs> yeah. So, so one, one, yeah, it can happen. But and if you don't, then you're not getting enough vitamin D. Mm -hmm. right. Or if you live in North Dakota, there's a reason why the North East has the highest levels of multiple sclerosis. It has the highest levels because it's the lowest rate of, of vitamin D. Vitamin D is protective for everything from inflammation to all diseases, all cancers. The higher your vitamin D up to an extent, you can't really get it too high without really trying. Uh, the higher that is, the more protected your body's going to be from every disease there is. There's a really cool graph on that. I didn't include it in here. Just take my word for it. It's, <laughs> it's, it literally cuts your risk of heart attack in half by getting the proper levels. And so if you've never had that tested, get it tested. It's a pretty easy, cheap test. You know, you want that level to be somewhere above <laughs> 60, 60 to 100 is kind of like your normal. Most people you test are going to be like in the, so rickets, you've heard of rickets, like the old, kind of doesn't happen a lot. That's at like eight. And so that's pretty low, but I've tested people and they've been in the teens, which is like you're set up for, for every disease under the sun. Your immune system doesn't work properly if your vitamin D levels aren't what they should be. So get those checked. They actually found out recently, this came out in this research, they made a mistake when they were uh, recommending the recommended daily allowance for vitamin D. They, they thought it was 600, it's actually 6,000 units per day. That's a big difference. Yeah, so. I mean, huge with, with breast cancer and, and a lot of different cancers, that, that vitamin D level, it really needs to be up there. We got our vitamin D in the back. The nice thing with vitamin D, with our vitamin D especially, is it has a probiotic with it, so it gets absorbed. It actually, you know, it's, you are not what you eat, you are what you absorb, you know? And so if you're eating something, you know, some vitamin just pass right through you. If you take it with the fat and that probiotic, it actually gets absorbed a lot easier. And it has to be that active form of vitamin D, the D3, not, not the, and then magnesium is a huge one. Anybody take magnesium? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, magnesium is, is like a vital substrate for every chemical process that you, goes on in your body. Really needs proper levels of vitamin D. A lot of muscle issues with vitamin D. One of the big things it does is, is getting down inflammation. Sleep better with magnesium. That's, that's one of those that's really, really easy to take. You can notice immediate benefits, and it makes it easy. Like Dr. Amber used to be narcoleptic. And used, she found, to be. used to be. She's not anymore because she found out how low her magnesium levels were really, really low. And just you know, highly stressed. 
Stress. It helped everything. Yep. It depleted. Nutrition. <laughs> changed lifestyle. It actually tastes good too, like ours. Ours is yeah. the best one. It tastes like a pomegranate flavor. Oh my goodness. Yeah. 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 So, you're, <laughs> Howard, you were saying, what did you say about biking? You go bike 20 miles. Yeah, that's the day I had a heart attack. So, <laughs> you ever heard of Jim Fix? Anybody yeah. ever remember yeah. Jim Fix? The running guy. Yeah, the running guy. Yeah. He, he invented running. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, I, when people say that, I'm like, I'm pretty sure people have been running before. Yeah. <laughs> he, he invented it as a, he patented it really and made it popular as like a sport to go running or go jogging. And guess what he died of? Yeah. Yeah. So what happens is long, slow distance increases, long, slow distance exercise, whether that's running marathons or biking 20 miles, it actually increases, there, there's a threshold where if you go too much, it increases your stress response. And so, uh, and you, you don't, I don't think anybody in here is in danger of running marathons, right? Nobody's <laughs> doing that anymore. No. Nope. But you have to move your body. You absolutely have to get oxygen to your tissues. But if you do it too much, anything in excess is a problem. Right? Let that sink in for a minute. Anything in excess is a problem. I agree. You, gotta, you gotta think about that. Like it's, even the good stuff in excess sometimes can be, a, can be an issue. Balance, balance in life. Um, yeah, so so long, slow distance actually ends up increasing cortisol a lot, so you really got to be careful with <coughs> inflammation. The by far the best, who does burst training? What? <laughs> burst training or high intensity, yeah. Also so, known as surge. Surge training, yeah. So all that is, is high intensity for a short duration of time. 10 to 20 minutes is all you need at a high higher heart rate to, to get the benefits and they're lasting, you know, when you're doing high intensity, like a burst type training, those benefits are lasting you for the next 36 hours. Versus if you just go run, if you say, say you go jog a mile um, and stop, as soon as you stop and your heart rate comes back down to normal, you're, you're done. Your, your metabolism doesn't change, you're, you're not burning fat long term. But when you do that type burst type training where you're up and you're moving and you're getting your heart rate really high and going, 36 hours later, you're still, having, you're still getting the benefits of that higher heart rate and then that increased metabolism. And put, so the reality is we gotta just move. And this is, this is, like exercise isn't really difficult. You just gotta move. <laughs> you think about our ancestors and what they did day in and day out there. You know, milking the cows or they're, you know, whatever, hunting, foraging, digging, whatever they're doing, they weren't sitting at a desk all day doing this, right? There's, there's just, our bodies aren't designed for that type of lifestyle. And so if that is your job or you got it, you have to sit at a desk all day or whatever, you gotta get moving somehow and, and make sure that you're complimenting that. Because that that again, even though that doesn't seem like a stress, that is such a huge stress, not only in your spine, but just in your entire lifestyle. You really have to just get your body moving, whether it's a walking the dog or, or going on a jog at you know at night, probably not during the day <laughs> right now anyway. Um, swimming, go to the beach, not right now, again, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, just do it inside right now. Yeah. When you said running a marathon, what about a long walk? Yeah, a long walk's fine. Well, it's not, you're, not, you're not stressing your body out, you're not getting that, that okay. you know, if you heard about people when they run a marathon, you get sick afterwards, yeah. you get a cold, because you, I mean, yeah. Yeah, you suppress your immune system so much that it just has to. So it's same just, thing if you run a, a bike ride, but you're not racing, you know, you just. Yeah, okay. you're not. You're not in danger of like going too far. You're not gonna go ride your bike for five hours or something like that. And if you do that, you're not gonna do it consistently. It's the people that do that consistently that actually lead to more issues. <clears throat> so this is, we could do like a whole three hours just on the mindset here. So so I won't, I'm not gonna say a whole lot here. You just have to figure out what works for you to de-stress and rest. So, so myself, that's getting outside of nature. Right, I'll just go and walk along the back creek and watch like otters and or, or climb trees or whatever. Dr. Amber, that's yoga, right? Whatever whatever works for you, whether it's reading a book, whether it's sitting with a, a cup of coffee in the morning and, and just relaxing, even though coffee kind of decaf. <laughs> yeah, decaf. Yeah, yeah. Tea. Coffee. Tea. Yeah. But tea. whatever works for you to de-stress or rest and realize that yesterday's gone, like it, it has no bearing on today. Tomorrow is just an illusion. And so if you're worried about either one of those two, 
you're missing out on everything right now. That's not real, and this isn't real anymore because it, it's already gone. And so just be present and, and be here in a moment and, and appreciate it. I'm telling myself this just as much as I tell anyone else this. Being right here, right now, and being where you are <laughs> and appreciate all that's around. Like, it's so easy to get lost in what's next, what bills do I have to pay, what, what you know, what's, what's going to happen in this relationship down the road, what's going to happen in, um, you know what I mean? Like, we go through these things. Like, if you think of the, the thoughts that are going through your head and, and count the, the amount of thoughts that you have in your head any given day, it's like in the 65,000 range. Guess how many of those are actual, like, real going to happen thoughts? Very few. Very few. Less than a percent. The rest is all just projection of something else, of fear, a past pattern, or whatever. And so becoming aware of that, have you ever, ever sat and sit and like have a conversation in your head and be aware? Have you ever observed your thoughts? That's pretty cool. If you think about that, you think about the fact that you can observe your thoughts, meaning that you are not your thoughts. The battlefield of mind. But if you can look at your thoughts and analyze them, then you are not your actual thoughts. You can actually zoom out past that and remove yourself from that state. So that takes practice to do. It's not a, a, you'll never probably get perfect at it, but the more you can do that, be mindful, whether it's yoga, like I said, whether it's um, journaling, whatever it is, get something that can take you out of that stress response. That will save your life more than anything else. If, if that's all you do, you'll be better than 99% of the population. Add that with some good nutrition, with getting your spine addressed and corrected and making sure all your wires are working properly, moving your body, exercising, and minimizing toxins, which we didn't even, we did a toxicity workshop last time, so we're not gonna go through all that, but there's a lot there too. Um, and asking different questions. If there's a symptom, ask what the cause is. You know, if there's, if there's a disease, there's a cause, and a disease is just a set of symptoms. But the reality is that your body is designed to heal. We have that inborn innate intelligence in all of us. Whether it's diagnosed with a heart attack and clogged arteries or cancer or autoimmune issues or whatever, your body is designed to heal and it wants to function at its full ability. And so everyone's full ability may be different. You know, my 100% is not your 100%, it's not your 100%, but getting as close to you can as that is gonna be the closest you'll ever get to living um, a life, I would say, I was gonna say a life free of disease, but that's not the goal, right? The, the goal is to live your best life. And not avoiding something, not afraid of something, not fearful, but it's being in the present, being being able to um, impact the world in, in, in a way, whether that's with your kids and being there for them to grow up and, and have grandkids and have great grandkids and, and be there for all those moments, whether it's in a relationship or a spouse, or your mission and vision, whatever you want to, however you want to impact society and humanity, that's what the goal is. That's that's why you want to be healthy, right? <laughs> it's not just so you avoid something. You don't want to just just avoid heart disease. You want to be there for your kids down the road, you know. And addressing that from that side and, and, and getting your big why and understanding why you're waking up and making the choices that you're making, because it's a whole lot easier just to be led by this primal like, uh, I want pizza, I'm gonna eat pizza. I want alcohol, so I'm gonna have alcohol. I want, just, if, if you're led by just your, your superficial desires, we see what that leads to health-wise. So you have to have some substance there to realize why, here's the decisions I'm making, here's why I'm making them, here's the, uh, uh, or the lens I'm putting on to see my world through and see your health through. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yeah, what about aspirin? Aspirin. <laughs> So, so one of the biggest studies ever done, I realize I, I missed some stuff on here too. <laughs> okay. um, ever done, they looked at, they, they actually, this is a, prescribing baby aspirin for heart disease is a pretty worldwide thing. Mm -hmm. So they actually looked at over 100,000 people from everywhere from China to New Zealand to the US to South America, looking at, as, as a whole, what's the benefit of taking aspirin a day? And as a whole, they found that there is literally no benefit in the changes in any kind of cardiac outcomes, but there was an increase in the risk of kidney disease, liver disease, digestion issues, uh, and your chances of dying were actually higher due to stuff like strokes or injuries, stuff like that. Huh. Biggest study ever done, over 100,000 people looking at a huge meta-analysis, literally no benefit. <laughs> 
And guess how many people know that? How many people are told that? You don't see any commercials about that, do you? So the other thing when it comes to blood pressures, I want to I, I, I meant to put a video in here and it just didn't it didn't work with everything. So when your blood pressure is high, the other thing, remember I was talking about that vagus nerve, mm -hmm. your brain stem? Yeah. So there's a, a, obviously chiropractors have known that adjusting your spine and, and may, putting your nervous system back in a state of healing is going to lower your blood pressure. We've known that for a, hundred, a long time. It, it changes your blood pressure when you adjust your spine and take it out of a stress response into a healing. So there's a bunch of medical doctors in Chicago that got all up in arms that chiropractors were saying they could lower blood pressure. So what they did is they designed this huge double-blind randomized controlled trial, University of Chicago, to see what the difference was. And they did, um, a group got adjusted, the other group didn't get adjusted. And what they found, that in the end of the results, they kind of had to eat, eat some uh, crow. Eat some crow, crow that's what it was. <laughs> uh, is that it, getting adjusted lowers your blood pressure better than two medications, better than lisinopril and hydrocodothiazide. And that's one adjustment. One adjustment and it lasted six weeks. So what do you think corrective care would do? Taking a stretch, that's huge. So we know that blood pressure is not caused by a lack of lisinopril or hydrocodone. It's a stress response, balancing the body, getting the stress out, restoring the proper nervous system integrity, allows your body to get back to that healing state. Yeah. Taking a 